hello. Uh, my name is Evan. I work at Shopify. We're an e-commerce company. Uh, we're actually mostly known as a, a Ruby on Rails shop, so, but we do a lot of other stuff in Go as well, so uh, here I am. Uh, this whole talk has its roots with me getting fed up by yet another article online that uses pipelines and worker pools to talk about and tout Go's concurrency model. I mean, concurrency is so much more than that. Uh, Go eco Go's ecosystem tries to sell us on this vision of concurrency as, as almost like a solved problem now. That now that we have channels and Go routines, that these, these wonderful primitives, that these tools are enough. But they're not, they're, they're just primitives. Uh, you can build great things with them, but they are not in themselves a solution to a lot of problems. Uh, so yeah, in theory, you can build your pipelines and worker pools, uh, but concurrency doesn't always work like that. And uh, don't get me wrong, Go is a huge step forward. Has anybody here ever like, tried to use pthreads or one of the older concurrency? Yeah, I'll take Go any day of the week. But uh, even with Go routines and channels, when your system is complex, uh, questions like this can still be hard, uh, and answers are not always obvious. Oh, that is, yes. Go away. There we go. You can actually see that now. So yes, Go makes concurrency easier, uh, a lot easier. It makes it way more accessible to, to a lot more developers, which is great. Uh, but it's still hard. So uh, this talk is really quite simply structured. Uh, it's basically a case study of a library that we wrote at Shopify. Uh, it's open source. Uh, it uses a lot of concurrent tricks and is written in Go, obviously. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of context, what the library is for, what it does, uh, what we use it for, and then we're going to walk through it. We're going to pull it apart, look at some of the, the patterns we use, some of the trade-offs we made, uh, we learned a ton building this library. It was our first real big project in Go. Uh, and so hopefully you'll learn some of that too. So let's start with a little bit of context. Uh, anybody recognize these, these people up on the screen? No, that's okay. Some of them are pretty obscure. Uh, on the left there, you have Franz Kafka, uh, an author known uh, primarily for The Metamorphosis and a few other books. In the middle, you have Jose Saramago, uh, who's a Portuguese author heavily influenced by Kafka. And on the right, you have Donald Knuth, uh, a computer scientist, probably needs no introduction, uh, the art of computer programming, and of many other seminal works. So you're probably wondering what these people have to do with anything. Uh, so let's start with Kafka. Kafka is also the name of a Java-based Apache project. It was started at LinkedIn a couple of years ago. Uh, it's for distributed publish subscribe messaging. It's almost already like the de facto standard for that, uh, that field. Uh, it's very popular. We use it at Shopify now. Uh, in Kafka, messages are grouped into topics, which are uh, semantic. So if you have an e-commerce company like us, maybe you have a topic for your checkouts. Uh, topics are then subdivided into partitions, which are not semantic. They're just for parallelism, so they're like database shards. And partitions are then individually led by brokers uh, and replicated onto other brokers, and brokers are just your nodes in the cluster. Now, the interesting thing about Kafka is that clients are very thick. It's not just like a network protocol you have to implement. There's a great deal of logic in the client that deals with uh, how to fail over between brokers and all sorts of other interesting stuff. So Shopify, we wanted to use Kafka, uh, but we didn't want to use the JVM. We're not a not a Java shop. Uh, we are not keen on putting the JVM everywhere. So we wrote Serama. And this brings us to our second author. Uh, Saramago uh, is a terrible, terrible pun. I apologize. The name stuck. I couldn't do anything about it after that point. Uh, he, uh, so Serama is a, a client library for Kafka implemented in Go. Uh, it implements the wire protocol and all of the complicated logic on top. Uh, the original version, way back in 2013, uh, on Go 1.0, was a uh, proof of concept. It was very simple. We ignored a lot of the complexity. We made it as simple as possible to work, uh, to make it actually work, because the complexity was 
to be honest, quite scary at the time. And uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil, right? And that brings us to our third author, because that's his, that's Knuth's line. Uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. But we should not ignore that critical 3% of, uh, of optimization opportunities. And it was that critical 3% that bit us. Because it turns out it, in Kafka, that complexity is there for a reason. Uh, the first draft of Serama that we wrote was very simple, very easy to understand. It worked. It was correct as far as it went. Uh, but it was also an order of magnitude too slow. Uh, so we salvaged what we could, and we rewrote it. Uh, the second draft of Serama that eventually became our 1.0 had a couple of requirements. It had to be fast, which in terms of Kafka means it had to be able to batch messages together, uh, trading off some latency on some of those messages in return for throughput. It had to be configurable. Uh, now that you're making a trade-off, that trade-off has to be configured depending on the needs of your application. If your application needs low latency and is willing to trade off a little throughput for that, we should let you do that. It has to be resilient. Uh, Kafka is a distributed system. Distributed systems often fail in pieces. Uh, and if one node fails, then that failure should not affect the rest of the system. The, the rest of the system has to keep going, or else what's the point of, of making it distributed in the first place? Uh, and it had to be correct, which is almost obvious, but given the other requirements, is not as simple as it sounds. Kafka has uh, some interesting requirements. So we wrote a producer and a consumer, uh, the producer that sends messages to Kafka and the consumer that reads messages back from Kafka. Uh, so let's tackle the producer first. This is the diagram of, of what the producer looks like in overview. It's a fairly scary diagram, uh, despite the smiley face at the top. Uh, that's the user, by the way. That's the user sending messages into the producer to be sent to Kafka. Uh, in this diagram, every arrow is a channel, and every box, every labeled box there, is a go routine. So that's more or less the complete graph of all of our communicating go routines talking to each other. Uh, we're going to work our way more or less from top to bottom, following the flow of, of a message as it is sent from the user and then uh, down and out to the actual Kafka cluster. Uh, quick disclaimer, the code that I'm going to show is looks like Go. It was copied from, from the actual library, but it's been simplified for the slides so much that it's basically pseudocode at this point. Uh, there's a lot of cases I'm explicitly ignoring. Don't read too much into it. Uh, so let's start at the beginning. Uh, this is the top fragment of the producer. This is where the user sends their message in and it goes through the initial processing. Uh, and this top layer primarily tackles that third requirement I mentioned of resiliency, uh, which basically means keeping errors isolated uh, when an error occurs, because errors are going to occur. Everything else, all of the other topics, all of the other partitions, all of the other brokers, they all have to keep working because uh, other things are relying on them. Now in Kafka, the most granular level at which you can receive an error is at the partition level. Uh, the partition is the most granular thing here. So the simplest way in Go to isolate something is to put it in its own Go routine. That's a really basic trick, uh, very straightforward. So that's like the very first thing we do here is we fan out. We take all of the messages in at the dispatcher. We fan them out uh, from the dispatcher to the topic producers, which is one per topic, and then from there to the partition producer, which is one, uh, one per partition. And fan out code is really pretty straightforward. Uh, it looks more or less like this. You have a, a map of your handlers, uh, your output channels. You read a message from your input channel. You look up the appropriate output channel, and you send it on its way. If there is no output channel, you create one first. Uh, but this isn't actually quite enough. This isolates every uh, partition to its own Go routine, great, but there's a problem, and that problem is that every step of the way here, uh, the dispatcher and the topic Go routines and the partition Go routines, they can all, on occasion, make network calls uh, to fetch metadata from the cluster, various things like that. Uh, and network calls can block. Network calls can be slow, they can fail in interesting ways, they can fail in really surprising ways sometimes. Uh, so what happens in this situation if our partition go routine blocks? Well, if it's stuck in a network call, then it's not reading from its input channel. 
And if it's not reading from its input channel, then the topic go routine that's trying to feed it is going to block writing to that channel. And if the topic uh, go routine blocks, then it's not reading from its input channel, and the dispatcher is going to block. And if the dispatcher blocks, then of course the user is going to block. And all of a sudden, the entire system has ground to a halt. That entire chain has blocked, and everything else is not receiving any messages because of one bad network call, which is really not ideal. Uh, Kafka is mostly an in data center technology. So you can set your timeouts pretty low. That helps. Uh, but there's actually there's a better option, uh, and that is circuit breakers. Circuit breakers are becoming a very common pattern these days in distributed systems and in particular in microservice architectures. Uh, they work basically by protecting code that can fail so that even when it fails, it at least fails quickly. And that's fine for us. Things are going to fail. All we care about is that they fail quickly so that other messages keep flowing and everything else keeps, to, keeps working. Uh, so the top line here is a typical API call. It makes a network request, so it can be slow, it can fail, do, uh, do all, anything it wants, basically. On the bottom, you have the same API call wrapped in a circuit breaker uh, to protect it. And that breaker, you pass it a, an, a function, in this case, an anonymous function. And 99% of the time, it just runs that function. Uh, like it, so those two, those two snippets of code do exactly the same thing. However, when the method starts to fail, when that API call starts to fail or be slow, then the breaker has the option, the, the circuit opens, uh, just like a, a circuit breaker in a, an actual electrical circuit. At which point, the method doesn't even get run. The breaker just immediately returns an error saying, I, like, the circuit has been opened, something has gone wrong, fail quickly. And that's all we need. The circuit fails quickly, uh, the message is rejected immediately, and all the other messages keep flowing. <laughs> so once a message has reached the partition go routine, once it's, it's uh, been isolated to its own partition go routine, it then passes through that little cloud in the middle of the diagram. I don't know, it was, it was really small, so I don't know if anybody saw it. Uh, and that cloud is basically my super lazy way to diagram a lot of arrows I didn't feel like drawing. Um, uh, so it's a dynamic many to one mapping uh, between partitions and brokers. So every partition in Kafka is led by a broker, is led by one node in the cluster. And that mapping can change. Uh, a partition can be led by one broker and then if that broker fails or if uh, the cluster rebalances for some reason, suddenly that partition can be led by an entirely different node. So you have to manage this mapping somehow. You have to manage, you have to be able to follow that in the producer saying, all right, I'm sending these messages to this broker, and now I'm sending them over here somewhere different. Uh, the simplest and, and safest way to do that is to leave it entirely in the hands of each partition go routine. So make every one of them completely isolated, know exactly which broker they care about, and, and leave it at that. Um, but that actually has a, a different problem. There's nothing technically wrong with that, but it makes the speed requirement we have here basically impossible to, to match because the whole purpose of the whole requirement behind that speed uh, requirement is to batch messages together, is to take messages destined for the same broker and put them in the same network request to avoid those many, many round trips that you would otherwise need. Uh, and if each partition go routine is, is figuring out its own broker in an isolated way, then when two partitions end up on the same broker, which is a very common occurrence, they don't know about it. They don't know that those messages can be batched together. They have no idea. So we need some centralized state, uh, which is nothing crazy, uh, just a, a singleton global locked reference counted map. Uh, it's not a terribly revolutionary concept here. Uh, it's a little unusual in a language that is both channel oriented and garbage collected. Uh, but the lock is, it's really the simplest way to, to solve this problem. Uh, and the reference counting is also kind of the simplest way to solve this problem, which sounds a bit odd. But uh, you end up with a, an acquire release pattern. So you acquire a broker and then when you're done with it, when that partition has moved somewhere else, you release it back to the pool before acquiring your, acquiring your next one. 
And, and those methods look something like this. On the left, you have the acquire method, which takes the lock, uh, looks up the broker in the map, uh, and then uh, increments the reference count before returning it. And if, of course, if there's no broker in the map yet, it creates a new one. Uh, and then on the release broker, you also take the lock, you decrement the reference count, and if and only if the reference count is zero, then you delete it. Uh, the reference count is important here because regardless of how many partitions are referencing that uh, broker at any given time, from the perspective of the garbage collector, it's still being referenced by the map itself. So if we didn't reference count and delete here, uh, those brokers that ended up unused would effectively be leaked. So again, not a revolutionary concept. Reference counting has been around for ages. Mutexes have been around for even more ages, I'm sure. Uh, a little unusual in Go, but it's just a matter of always using the right tool for the job. So once we, uh, once the message has reached the broker or the, the, uh, the third component in our, our little diagram here, this is the final step in the successful path for a message. A successfully produced message ends here. Uh, we have all of these messages coming in from multiple partitions that are all headed to the same broker which is great, we can batch them up, we can wrap them into a single network request, be very efficient about it, and then put them on the wire. Uh, and this seems like a fairly simple task, this seems like you should be able to do it in a single go routine with just a little loop, uh, but there are a couple of complications, because it's Kafka, there are always complications. Uh, the first complication is that requests here, the network request to actually send these messages, can be very slow in the successful case. Uh, we're used to network requests like timing out after 10 seconds, being slow that way. These are requests that because of the, the work they generate on the cluster can take 10 or 15 seconds to succeed. And that's not like an aberration, that's, that's normal behavior. So you have to be able to handle that, again, without blocking the rest of the world for 10 or 15 seconds. The other complication here is that you have to be able to handle timer events. Uh, that configuration requirement I mentioned involves, in a lot of cases, setting timers up to say, all right, you know, I don't want to hold anything for more than 500 milliseconds or, or what have you. Uh, and those timer events have to fire and those events have to be handled. Now, Go does not let you select on a channel and a network request at the same time, which is a bit, I find that a bit funny given the select statement's origin as actually selecting only on network requests but uh, it doesn't let you do that. So we have to split that out into two, two go routines anyways. Uh, the aggregator, which is, uh, does most of the real work, to be honest, and then the broker producer, which is just responsible for putting things on the wire and handling the responses. The aggregator looks something like this. Uh, it's a for loop wrapping a big select statement. Uh, it acts like a dynamic buffer, a flow controller. Uh, it builds the requests, so for every input message it gets, it puts it into the request. Uh, and then it uses this, this really clever trick of uh, the nil channels in select statements, which is like one of these weird corners of the language uh, that is just super useful sometimes and super confusing other times. Uh, Normally, when you try to write to a nil channel, that is going to panic. That's something that will panic at runtime, uh, and people avoid it for obvious reasons. Uh, however, when you have a, a case in a select statement that writes to a nil channel, that case doesn't panic. That case is simply ignored, as if it's not there. Uh, so it's as if the select statement didn't have that case at all. Now, of course, channels can be nil or not, and that can be changed dynamically at runtime, which means that by toggling whether a channel is nil or not inside the select statement, we can actually change the shape of our select statement entirely dynamically uh, without like going into reflection or any of the real dynamic select statements. So what we do here is we leave the output channel nil most of the time. Uh, so that last case, uh, that where we feed the request into the output channel to be put on the wire, doesn't trigger 99% of the time. However, when the request is full, when we've gotten enough messages, or when the timer fires, uh, and we're, we're gonna put it on the wire anyways to avoid undue latency, then we set that uh, output channel to a real value. So the next time through the loop, that output channel can be selected. Uh, maybe it's not that next time, maybe it's the, like, 
the subsequent time. But suddenly that's available for the runtime to send on. Uh, and so once we've sent it, once we've put that request on the wire, we can then reset it to nil, uh, generate a new request, and that case is dead again until we're ready to send a new request. It's a very handy trick. The broker producer uh, part of this, the, the other half of this is really very simple. It takes a request at a time, puts it on the wire, and then handles the response. Uh, the interesting thing here is that is not this code in particular, but in the way it interacts with the previous, uh, the previous loop, and that they spin together, uh, like, almost like gears on a bicycle. Uh, because for every, uh, every n rotations, every n iterations that the aggregator loop makes through its select case, this loop makes exactly one. Uh, now for successful messages, that's it. Uh, they're put on the wire, they uh, come back with a success response, the success response is basically does nothing because there's nothing else to do, and the garbage collector does its thing. However, unsuccessful messages are another story. Unsuccessful messages uh, have to be retried, of course. Uh, we can't just give up on the very first time they fail. And that's the final component of our producer, is the messages that are retried, how do we retry them? Uh, but again, it's not as simple as it sounds, because Kafka's kind of weird and kind of crazy. Um, there are a couple of problems with just sending the same message again, which is the obvious solution. Uh, the first is that you can have split responses. So when you send a request and you get your response, that response can say, well, okay, well, these messages succeeded, these messages failed. Uh, these messages failed because they're not even on this broker anymore. They should have been sent over here. And these messages, like at the end, these ones also succeeded. So you have to be able to parse that out and say, okay, like the successful ones we can ignore. The failed ones we have to retry. The ones that have been moved have to end up on some other broker in some other Go routine in our system. Uh, and that, they have to end up there. They have to end up on that other Go routine in the right order with all of the other messages that are still flowing down through the top part of our producer, which is uh, another interesting problem. So we looked at, at two kind of broad options here. Uh, you can see both of them on the left and the right here. Um, we didn't really like either of them, but let's leave that aside for a second. The first option uh, we looked at was for the partition Go routine to keep a queue to keep a list of all of the messages that it's seen, because it's seen them in the right order. It's the last point before that, that cloud, that dynamic muxing, that uh, keeps all of the messages in the right order. So then when the broker producer receives uh, an error or something like that, it can just send a message to the partition producer and say, all right, these messages succeeded. You can drop them from the queue. These messages failed. Please retry them. And it has them in the right order, and it can do the right thing. Uh, the other option we looked at was for each message individually to have a little bit of metadata associated locally uh, about whether it had been retried and on which brokers it had been retried. Uh, and then the broker producer can simply, when a message fails, it can simply send it right back to the top, right back to the dispatcher for it to flow through the same path as everything else uh, with a little bit of extra metadata associated. And that metadata can then be used at a later point to shuffle them around and make sure they end up in the right order. Um, so these were like the two options we looked at, but they both had a problem. We didn't really like either of them. Uh, and that problem is that they add a loop to the graph. So if you, if you think of that, that diagram I showed earlier as a graph, uh, a directed graph, then both of them add a cycle. And cycles are bad. In the simple case, like you have two Go routines that just try and talk to each other. Uh, if both of these Go routines, if A and B, try and send at the same time, that's going to block. They're both going to block. That's going to deadlock. Uh, Go will panic and, and your program will die, uh, which is not great. Uh, in the simple case here, this is solvable with a select statement. You can just put in a select statement like that, and uh, Go will m m take care of saying, all right, well, one of you is going to read and one of you is going to write, and then next time through, one of the other one can read and the other one can write. And, and everybody's happy. Uh, but this doesn't actually work for us. Uh, didn't work for us, and it won't work for a lot of cases that look sort of like a pipeline at first glance. Uh, 
because in a lot of those cases, when you read a message in, you then have to write that message out. And if you read a message in and then you can't write that message out, you read a second message in, well, suddenly you have two messages and you have to write both of them out. Uh, so maybe you put that like in a, in a buffer and say, all right, go back to my select statement. But then what happens if you read a third message? You now have three messages sitting in this go routine. You have to write all of them out. You have three writes, three writes to perform. Uh, but you, you have to go back to your select statement and maybe you'll read a fourth. And like, when does this stop? Uh, it, it doesn't. The, uh, what you've constructed here is an unbounded queue. And unbounded queues are all kinds of awful. Uh, they're a serious design smell in a lot of cases. Uh, and this is why, for example, Go doesn't provide infinitely buffered channels. You can provide a channel buffer that's a constant value uh, when you make your channel. But you cannot make a channel that has an infinite buffer. Uh, this is why unbounded queues are terrible. And if you ask in the forums, on the GoNuts forum, or for example, uh, like, how can I make an infinitely buffered channel? The answer you're going to get is invariably don't do that. It's bad. It's a bad idea. It's a, like, something is wrong. Something else is wrong with your program if you need to do this. So that's what we did. Uh, on the principle of that if it's stupid but it works, then it can't be that stupid. Uh, it is pretty stupid. And in hindsight, like there's a way around this that's a little more complicated where you don't need an infinite buffer at all. And we should have done that. But I only came up with that like while writing the talk, like six months after implementing this. So it's too late for us now. Uh, we, did, we went with option two. We went with a little bit of metadata and then just flowing through the same path. Uh, and we added a retry or go routine at the bottom. And that retry or go routine is basically just a stupid implementation of an infinite channel. Uh, it loops over the messages, uh, stores them in a buffer, uh, stores them in a slice, and then writes them out when it gets the chance. Uh, there are practical considerations to do with how Go's scheduler works and, and how Kafka works that means that this buffer isn't really infinite. There's a fairly weird limit you can work out on exactly how big it could get, which is not too bad. Uh, but this is still, this was a mistake. This was, if we'd, if we'd known what we were doing then, or if we'd, known, if we'd known what we know now then, we wouldn't have done this. We would have uh, worked out a way to avoid the infinite queue. So. This is the completed producer. Hopefully most of it makes sense now. We've, we've gone through all of the little pieces. Uh, we can pause briefly now. We, I'll go on to the consumer, the other upper half of the puzzle uh, shortly, but I'll pause briefly now. If there are any questions specific to the producer, uh, any of the code I've just shown, now is the time. So um, with the part of it that um, correlates the brokers with producers, you have that mutex acquire and release mm -hmm. code. An alternative way of looking at that you might want to think through is uh, using a bit of pi calculus where you actually send the ends of ch channels through channels. Mm -hmm. So you can create a service that issues the ends of channels that talk to brokers. So you can have a dynamic network where the topology of the network is changing because you're acquiring ends of channels to talk to brokers. And then you don't need to have that acquiring release that you're talking about. Um, I'm not 100% sure I understand, but every broker is, like the resource that's returned from those acquire and release methods is a channel that leads, uh, so that, that is a, a topology change when a broker is acquired. Uh, sure, but, but what I'm saying is you can actually send the ends of channels through channels. So, yes. so that, that, and that's the thing, that, that's the high order approach. That yes, so you could, you could do that, uh, you could do that uh, map as a, ch as a go routine and then have it send and receive sure. the channels itself. Uh, we looked at works. that, it basically ends up being slightly slower and slightly more code okay. uh, for exactly the same result. So if you're obsessed with avoiding mutexes, then it's the way to go. But in, in terms of concurrency patterns, sometimes it's appropriate to have that in mind. 
yeah, it depends on the situation for sure. For us, it wasn't really necessary. Anybody else? Cool. Moving on to the consumer. The consumer uh, came with its own set of challenges. Uh, it looks like this. This is hopefully slightly less scary now. Uh, we wrote it second. We wrote it after we, the producer was done and in production. Uh, so we were able to, to apply a lot of what we learned doing the producer uh, to the consumer right off the bat, which saved us a lot of time and a lot of headache. Uh, it doesn't have a top to bottom, like the producer was nice and flowed top to bottom, the consumer doesn't really do that, it flows, it's almost bottom to top or almost kind of inside out, uh, which basically just means that I'm going to jump around a bit, so it's a little, I apologize, it'll be a little probably harder to follow. Uh, but first, a more general principle that we learned from the producer that uh, saved us a lot of time here. Uh, this, this thing is how go routines are, are structured basically. Uh, like there's a couple of obvious ways to write your Go routines as an anonymous function or as a named function. Uh, but there's also, and named functions are easier to manage. Like a, an anonymous function is indented more uh, and is embedded in something else. So it's a little harder to manage. As it gets more complex, typically it gets a name and it gets moved out uh, to its own proper method. But when named functions themselves get too complex, then we started experimenting with this pattern, which uh, I call structuring. It's probably a better name for it somewhere. It's probably in the literature somewhere. But uh, it's a little more code, but it makes it a lot easier to manage very complex Go routines. So anonymous and named functions are very straightforward. Uh, you can go func, whatever, or you can declare a func with a name and then go that name. Uh, and refactoring between these two is very easy. If your Go routine starts at two lines, you make it anonymous. When it becomes 10 or 15, you give it a name and, and move it out, and that's fine. Uh, but when it becomes very long, when it becomes 80 or 90 lines, multiple nested loops, like this is where you want to start moving it out into helper methods. Uh, but helper methods, as we found doing the producer, can be tricky to get right because often, you know, the Go routine has five or six state variables inside of it. And you have to pass all of those to your helper method. And then you have to take four or five return values of all, which state has been mutated, and you end up with a, a function signature for this helper method that is exceedingly long and really quite annoying to work with. So the pattern that we ended up with uh, looks kind of like this. For every Go routine that we have that's of any significant complexity, we create a struct. Uh, and that struct contains the parameters and any state variables that are associated with that Go routine. Uh, we give that struct a run method, which is just the actual contents of the Go routine. But now it doesn't need parameters and it doesn't need a return. Uh, well, Go routines can't have return values. And then we give it a constructor that takes the parameters that uh, the Go routine would have taken originally, constructs the appropriate structure, and then runs the, the run method. And what this lets us do is it lets you um, write your helper methods as methods on this structure. You don't have to pass a bajillion parameters to them anymore. You don't have to worry about returning a bajillion parameters if you want to mutate some state. Uh, it just works and uh, it becomes a lot easier to manage. So we eventually refactored our producer to use this pattern everywhere, uh, which has helped a lot with readability. And we started the consumer right off the bat. We knew, okay, these, these Go routines that we're writing here, they're going to get big. So give them a struct and a constructor right off the top. And uh, it saved us a lot of time and a lot of headache managing a lot of that code. So now on to the first uh, kind of concrete piece of the consumer. Uh, this is another solution to a problem that we've already seen, uh, the uh, partition movement problem again in the producer that we saw where a partition can be led by one, one broker and if that broker goes away, it will move somewhere else. Or if, if the cluster rebalances for some reason, it will move somewhere else. Um, so in the consumer's case, like the, the, if this starts fairly simple. Every broker just keeps a list of, all right, these are the partitions that I care about. And it can add or remove to that list dynamically as partitions move around. Uh, but again, there's always a complication. Uh, and the complication here is that this 
again, can require network requests to ask the cluster for metadata to say, all right, like, I don't, I don't have this, this partition anymore. It's no longer my problem, but I need to know where to put it. Uh, and that can, again, those network requests can be slow. They can block. They can fail in surprising and unexpected ways. Uh, so again, it becomes a question of isolation. Uh, we have to keep those network requests isolated, not let them, like, uh, break down everything else in the system. Uh, so we create a go routine per partition again. We create a dispatcher here, and the dispatcher's job is simply to say, all right, this partition that I'm dispatching is now in limbo. It's not owned by the place it used to be owned by, but I have to figure out where it's owned by next, uh, and then make that network, network request. I can block, because there's, there's nothing else depending on me, so I can take my time, I can retry it, I can block, I can handle errors. Um, and when I figured it out, when I know where that, that partition is heading for, I can send it on. Uh, and handling that interaction then between the brokers, which are just those white boxes at the bottom because there's, we'll look at what's actually inside those boxes in a moment. Uh, and then inter that interaction between the broker and the dispatcher, you have basically ended up with this, this ownership token. Uh, so the broker has the token for a given partition. And then when the broker's done with it, it passes it up to a dispatcher. And then the dispatcher has the token. Uh, and then when the dispatcher finds out where it should go, it sends that token back to the appropriate broker. So whoever has that, that uh, magical token, all of a sudden, that's the go routine that owns the, uh, the state for that, uh, particular, that particular partition. And in that way, we don't even need a mutex around that state because only one go routine can access it at a time. Uh, and that go routine is whichever go routine has the token. So the dispatcher code looks basically like this. Uh, it has a trigger channel for receiving its ownership token on. When it receives the token, it finds the new, the new broker leader. Uh, and if, the bro if it finds one successfully, then it simply sends its ownership token on and, and it's done. However, if there's an error, then it backs off. It, it doesn't want to flood, flood the cluster with uh, useless requests, so it will sleep for a while. And then it will simply send itself the ownership token, which is a really kind of clever and simple way of continuing this loop. Uh, the channel that we're listening on has a buffer of one for this purpose. So it simply sends itself the ownership token and runs through the loop again. And we'll retry that as many times as it needs uh, in order to find a successful new leader and then send its ownership token there. The broker side of this uh, is all uh, in handling the response from the cluster. So when it's, it's made a request, it gets a response back. Uh, then it has to loop through that response and say, all right, which one, of these which one of my partitions failed? Which one of them succeeded? Do I have messages? Handle that. If, if it succeeded, if the request succeeded and it has messages, then it simply sends those messages to the user. However, if the, res if the request failed, uh, then it unsubscribes, it deletes that ownership token from its local storage, uh, and it sends it to the trigger channel of the, uh, of the dispatcher. And so, again, you have this ownership token which bounces back and forth between the uh, dispatcher and the broker, and it serves almost like a mutex, but a little bit more than that. So this was a problem, again, in part of isolation, uh, of keeping, that, keeping network request errors isolated to just, just what they've actually has gone, what, just what has actually broken. Uh, and continuing briefly with that theme, the inside of that box uh, that handles the, the broker side, it's almost exactly like in the producer. There's two go routines. One of them is responsible for most of the logic. The other one is responsible for actually doing the I.O. So I'm not going to get too much into that, just a few minor differences, uh, nothing really worth exploring in depth. Now, last but not least, uh, we get to turn a classic problem on its head. So uh, we're, as programmers, we're probably pretty used to, to having to deal with user input and say, all right, you know, I've asked for a number, but the user has given me a frog or the complete text of the Gettysburg Address or, you know, a pizza. And validating user input is a problem that we're, we're pretty used to at this point. Uh, 
we're not so used to is what surprised us here is being, having to validate user output or in particular having to deal with user with the user not even being there to receive their output. Uh, so the consumer sends its messages to the user on a channel. It's the, the nice asynchronous way to provide them with that data. But of course writing to a channel can block. And what pr problem we ran into a couple of times was we would write this message like hey we have a message for you user here's your message write it to the channel uh, and the user wouldn't be there the user would be hung in some other loop somewhere or they'd be stuck in a network request of their own or maybe that go routine had completely had panicked completely and, and gone away like and again this was a case where we would write to this channel and we would assume it would work and so we would write to this channel we would block uh, and then you know the go routine that was trying to talk to talk to that would also block and up the chain and suddenly the entire system had ground to a halt. Uh, all of our other users, all of the other consumers had become stuck on some internal transfer somewhere. And that one single go routine that like th that user had crashed our system basically uh, because they didn't read from a channel. So isolation again, we have to keep that problem isolated, a recurring theme here. Uh, again, first step is to put it in its own Go routine. So we spun up a response feeder Go routine. Uh, that is simply it takes a batch of messages and r writes them out to the user on that user's channel. Uh, which is again on its own not enough because simply writing to the response feeder will now block and the entire thing will propagate still. So we stuck a, a neat little trick into the response feeder. Uh, it looks like this. In the simple case here, it, it takes a batch of messages in and it just loops through them and writes them all out and then uh, sends an ACK back to the broker to say I'm done writing these messages and that's just a, a wait group. So the broker has a wait group uh, that it waits on and it gets an acknowledgement for every partition in its, uh, in its request. However, the interesting case is the second case in this select which is what happens when there's a timeout. What happens when we've tried to write this message to the user. Uh, and we found out that for whatever reason, maybe the user's just being slow, maybe they've gone away entirely, I don't know, that we can't, we can't write that message out. In that case, we forcefully unsubscribe ourselves from that broker. We, we claim back the ownership token. So now the ownership token is not on the broker's go routine anymore. That ownership token is now in our go routine. Uh, we tell the broker we're done, even though we're not. Uh, and then we can just feed those remaining messages out at our ledger uh, because the broker doesn't own this partition anymore so it's not going to do anything. We've told the broker we're done so it's just going to keep feeding the other partitions that are presumably still working uh, and so nothing else depends on us. So we can loop through the, those remaining messages, we can write them out. If the user's gone, who cares? Go routines are cheap. This will sit here until the program ends uh, and it won't really cost us anything at all. Uh, and then when we're done, assuming that the user, you know, is just stuck in a network request somewhere, uh, they time out eventually and they come back and start reading messages, then we have that broker still, we have that reference, so we can just uh, send it our, our uh, ownership token again and carry on uh, as if nothing ever happened. So the broker side code for this, like this is the, the clever bit, the broker side code is even simpler. It just adds the appropriate number of elements to its weight group feeds each uh, set of messages to the various response feeders and then waits for the wait group. And when that wait call returns, the broker, it doesn't actually know if all of the messages have been fed out, but it does know that every subscription has either fed its messages uh, successfully and returned and is ready for more, or it's unsubscribed itself. So the next time through the broker's loop, it doesn't even have to worry about that partition anymore. So that's basically it for the consumer. Uh, You've got a response feeder and a dispatcher that are, there's one of those per partition. You have a subscription manager and a broker consumer, there's one of those per broker. And uh, they communicate back and forth uh, fairly, fairly straightforward, I hope. So now, any questions specifically related to the consumer? Oh, yeah. I just wanted to, to say you were talking about how to name the pattern of, of having a, a struct with a run method attached and it, it, it reminds me of an actor 
Yeah, um, I'm not super familiar with, with, I think it's Scala and other actor-based uh, languages, but that certainly sounds plausible to me. Very interesting. Uh, you mentioned that Go routines are cheap. They're cheap to create, but they're also roots for a whole lot of your heap, and so you don't want to leave them lying around after you've yeah. gotten them stuck. So we don't really know at what point, if ever, the user is going to come back. Um, we could presumably provide a second timeout and say, like, go away entirely after this amount of time has, has elapsed. It's never been a problem for us thus far, because in all of the cases where we had blocked in reality, it was always just a slow network call. So it did come back after 10 or 20 seconds. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a reasonable concern. If the, if the user's actually gone away completely and was not coming back, you might want to throw a second timeout in there. Cool. So we learned a bunch of lessons uh, doing this, this project. Uh, Channels are primitives, and they're for communication. They're, they're your communication primitive. They're commu they communicate between your Go routines. But what we found out, and what you've just seen, is that we ended up writing a ton of Go routines and a ton of extra channels just to manage communication between like, the Go routines doing quote unquote real work. Uh, like We had Go routines with circuit breakers and timeouts and, and all of these extra patterns just to manage the communication that channels on their own are not complex enough to handle, uh, which is fine. They're primitives, but be aware of that. And on that topic of Go routines, structure them uh, or maybe make them into actors. Uh, it's a, we found it a very handy pattern uh, for managing that complexity uh, and managing that without 100 uh, parameters and, and return values in every, in every helper. Uh, don't trust the network or the user, of course. We're used to these, these lessons now. Uh, but don't trust them in any case. Don't trust the network to, be, to be, uh, succeed quickly. Don't trust the user to be there to receive the output that you're, you're trying to send them. Uh, infinite buffers smell. I cannot stress this one enough. Uh, it, it's bitten us once. Like, if you find yourself writing an infinite buffer or in the, in the process of designing something that seems like it ought to benefit from an infinite buffer, take a step back, reevaluate. There is usually there's a way around it if you look hard enough and long enough. Uh, and it makes a lot of other things a lot easier to reason about. Uh, and of course, don't be afraid of locks. Don't be afraid of reference counting. All of these things that we kind of think of as, oh, they shouldn't really be necessary in Go anymore. Sometimes they're still the right tool for the job. Uh, channels and Go routines do not solve every single problem in concurrency. Always use the right tool for the job. So credits for the photos. And thank you. Any final questions? Uh, just picking up on the comments about actors, uh, there is quite a strong correlation between this style of write and go routines with state um, that behave like actors. Um, there's, there's a very big difference, however, which is the actor model. Every actor has a single infinite smelly queue of, of data that's being fed into it. And obviously with go, you have a lot more control of how the channels are configured. So um, it's actually a m more sophisticated model using Go, uh, I think, than, than actors. Interesting. Um, what languages would, would provide that model with an infinite queue by default? Uh, well, I've worked with Akka, which is uh, Java and Scala. Um, it, the, the Akka model is like the Scala actors, which are now deprecated. And um, the... the ACA actors are essentially a, a way of dressing up callbacks. Your actor sits at the end of, a, of an infinite queue and you write the code that, that pulls things off the queue and processes each item, which might involve putting messages into queues of other actors. Interesting. And, and that's all you've got. You've got the one input channel. You can't change that input channel. It's just an infinite input queue. That's a, 
I find that somewhat surprising, but uh, I'll, I'll have to look at that more. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah, just what someone else I think was picking up there, Erlang is um, infinitely buffered by default and it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting thing to look at. Um, it has pros and cons, but mm -hmm. infinite buffers can be. Really yeah, handy. the thing about infinite buffers is that there's no such thing. Your system only has a, a finite amount of RAM. I mean, if anybody invents a computer with an unlimited amount of RAM, please, I will buy one. But in reality, computers have a fixed amount of RAM. Uh, and so even if your queue is, is not bounded by software, at some point you're just going to run out of memory and your program's going to crash anyways. So you might as well think ahead and handle that, that case proactively. Yeah, but uh, the thing is that you often end up trading infinite buffers in a channel for stacking up go routines, and go routines can actually be more expensive than buffer space, so it, it's all trade-offs and there are pros and cons, um, but yeah. For sure. So with, with that in mind, how are you, with that in mind, how are you um, looking to solve that problem? So the, uh, in particularly in the producer case here, yeah, so we, the, the uh, solution that I eventually came up with uh, and have not yet worked up the courage to refactor uh, is that in the first of our two solutions, in the solution where the partition manager keeps a fixed queue, uh, not infinite, uh, and then the broker sends back acknowledgments saying, all right, these messages can be dropped, these messages have to be retried in the correct order. Uh, the thing about those is that the acknowledgments that get sent back are ranges, uh, and they're ranges that are contiguous uh, one to the next. So you can do a little math, basically, and given two return, if you read two messages, you can turn those back into one by collapsing those ranges together. Uh, and so you don't actually need to keep an infinite buffer of messages you've read in. You just need to keep one and keep doing these neat uh, idempotent operations to merge them together. More questions? Anybody else? No. Hi there. How does the uh, Go concurrency compare to the Java concurrency in the original? I don't know. Uh, I'm not really a big Java expert. I've, uh, I believe it does rather a different style because Java's can, uh, well, okay. First thing is that the Kafka brokers are actually written in part in Java and part in Scala, and I don't know any Scala. so. Uh, they do a bunch of stuff that I don't really understand, to be quite honest. But from what I gather, it's a rather different model, and it doesn't look really anything like this. I, when I was first writing the first prototype, I did look through some of the design documents for the, the uh, JVM version and to get some ideas, and I decided pretty quickly that the, the underlying models are so different, it was better to start from scratch. Any more questions? Awesome. Thank you very much.